I mean, this year is the first time that we really see people um, taking care about reading or learning about the crypto space. Um, they want to get involved. It's more professional clients that are entering the space, professional investors like family offices, asset managers, crypto fund of funds, and even trusts. Welcome back to another edition of COVID-19 from Crisis to Creation here on Mentory TV. I'm Patricia falco your host. 2020 is soon going to come to an end, but we are still living the perfect storm with the pandemic, with the economic crisis, and also the job market not doing too well either. But what about the investors? How have they been investing, if at all? And the equity markets have been doing well so far in 2020. The Dow pretty much flat. However, the S&P 500 up about 8%, the NASDAQ up about 31%, but there is one market I want to raise the flag upon, and that is the cryptocurrency market. Absolutely on fire, perhaps building another bubble, I don't know, but if you look at the CCI 30 index, it's up another 90% this year. That is nine zero. And uh, coins such as Cardano up more than 220% for the year, what is happening in this space, in the cryptocurrency market? So let's ask some questions, whether this is something you should be potentially investing in, yes or no, and how hard or easy it is. I invited Desiree Valoya, she's the co-founder and partner at Crypto Consulting AG and Swiss Rex AG, to Mentory TV. She is also a very young entrepreneur. Desiree, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. I'm happy to be here today. I'm so glad you made yourself available because there's so much happening in the crypto space. I'm a tech geek. I love that space. And also decentralized finance is really picking up because of this momentum in the cryptocurrency market. But you and I will stay pretty much in that space because your company, your young company, you launched, I think about uh, two years ago, uh, you launched a fund and a certificate giving us the non, you know, the, the non-institutional investors the chance to invest in this space. Tell us a little bit about how you see cryptocurrencies in 2020 and also going forward. What is the status quo right now as well? Yeah, actually we launched almost three years ago in June 2018. And I remember very well by then, uh, there was a lot of skepticism. People didn't know about Bitcoin nor altcoins yet. And there has been a lot of change since then. I mean, this year is the first time that we really see people um, taking care about reading or learning about the crypto space. Um, they want to get involved. It's more professional clients that are entering the space, professional investors like family offices, asset managers, crypto fund of funds and even trusts. Um, but we are seeing the crypto space very positively actually at the moment. Our exposure is at 100%. That means we really want to be part of it because we think according to our uh, fundamental valuation models that there is a lot of potential for the next one or two years or even further out. I mean, Desiree, you're definitely risk on being 100% invested in the crypto space. That's like a risk on on steroids, that's for sure. But let me quickly re remind our viewers about the performance of your Swiss Rex crypto fund. Year to day, it's up about 150%. That's year to day. And uh, that compares the, to the CCI 30 index, as I just said, uh, up about 90%. So you're certainly outperforming. It's great so far, but let me ask you about your asset allocation. I think that's very important. Where have you been and what were your last changes and, and where does it lead to in terms of performance potentially? So uh, we have two um, levers or two options to um, get a good performance compared to our benchmark. One, um, one, uh, one tool we have is the asset allocation. So we can decide to have an asset allocation of between minus 20% and plus 120% net exposure. And actually, uh, when we started the fund, the net exposure was uh, quite low for quite a long time because 
We didn't see valuations where we wanted them to see yet. Um, only in November last year, we really started to increase the exposure to around 100 or even 120 percent, the maximum, which was tough at the beginning because markets were still uh, correcting a bit. But at the beginning of the year, we had a great performance. And as you said correctly, our crypto fund has made 150 percent year to date, while Bitcoin did 40 percent in the meantime. Yeah. And Ethereum, I think even less. So it's interesting interesting to see that you're starting to have like the blue chip kind of uh, cryptocurrencies and then you have the newcomers and that brings me not only into the asset allocation generally but how you actually find those coins that you think will outperform the old guys so in terms of the exposure this year we saw quite uh, an overvaluation around february so we decided to cut the exposure from 100% to 50%. Of course, we couldn't know that Corona would uh, come and uh, have a massive impact on the markets overall. But for us, it gave us a good chance to actually buy back the tokens at very low prices in March when markets collapsed. So we increased it again to 100%. And that's where we are currently and we, where we feel very comfortable at. So this is only the one tool that we can use, the asset allocation. The second tool is the token selection. And that brings us to the question you just asked. Um, we actually choose around eight to 10 tokens we invest in on average to get a good diversification in our portfolio. And we actually do this based on fundamental research. I think we are one of the very few funds that are really doing fundamental research of crypto. And I get asked many times from investors, uh, how is it possible to fundamentally value Bitcoin? Or yeah, that would have been mine. Yeah, absolutely. What, yeah. what sort of metrics do you use? Yeah, of course, there are no cash flows, so we cannot use discounted cash flow analysis or uh, traditional models. I mean, not yet. We are seeing security tokens entering the market. These are tokens that pay dividends, for example. And as soon as we have these cash flows, again, we can use traditional models. But for most of these tokens, we actually differentiate them um, in store of value tokens, currencies and securities. And for store of value tokens and currencies, we have come up with our own model, the SwissRex model. And you will find reports on the model on uh, our SwissRex website. And what we do is basically we take different variables into account, like the velocity of a token, how often often can a token uh, change hands per year and is this increasing or decreasing because as soon as it's increasing it's like an additional supply and additional supply dilutes the value of a token in general so for example with bitcoin it's pretty uh, unique that um, the velocity is actually decreasing because people uh, often keep Bitcoin and want to hold it for the long term. So we are actually seeing decreasing velocities. What we also look at is the inflation, which is different with almost every token. I mean, we know Bitcoin um, pretty well by now. Uh, the current inflation of Bitcoin is 2% per year, 2% of new tokens get into the market. This is uh, very similar to gold. And um, this will decrease in the future. Well, I think this inflation and also the velocity are two metrics which are very important to elaborate on a little bit more, Desiree, because it's not necessarily that it triggers the right kind of association with somebody that is not that familiar. And a lot of our viewers might not be in the crypto space uh, or just sniffing into it. The inflation you were saying, if I get it right, is how many more Bitcoins are entering into the market, so the supply. Is that right? Correct. Okay. And the velocity then, once it's in the market, on the other hand, means how quickly is it changing between the owners? So the market movement themselves or, uh, yeah, perhaps the, 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 the trading volume, if I may say it that way. So it's comparable to cash. If I have 10 francs in cash, it takes a while for me to give it to you, to hand it over to you. And with tokens, this is going so much faster because with the blockchain, we have such fast, cheap 
transactions, that velocity is getting so much faster compared to, tra to the traditional world. And does velocity mean higher demand, i.e. then an increase, potential increase in the price of the coin? It can come from higher demand. But uh, as I just explained with Bitcoin, if people just keep their positions, they don't want to give it away. I mean, higher demand then just creates higher prices. This has a lot to do with elasticity as well. Mm -hmm. But this is already quite specific. And these are more the supply side dynamics. And from the demand side, we actually uh, simulate an S-curve adoption as is very common with new technologies. There is a slow adoption at the beginning. Then there is exponential growth and then a flattening of the curve. So that's how we try to look at demand and supply dynamics. And what we are currently seeing from the demand side is really a lot of demand from more professional investors because of the current environment, which is negative interest rates, which is a loss of trust in central banks, inflation fear. Um, this all contributes to uh, big demand. Absolutely. But you see, with, with regards to the velocity and the inflation, these are kind of technicals you're looking at. And I wonder about the fundamentals, because if I look at the actual blockchain protocols, some of these coins run on, you think like all, all the business model they stand for in terms of coins and tokens. You think, okay, these are companies that do specific things, but not necessarily are profitable. So does the value really reflect the fundamental, which, is, which it doesn't do even in the stock market, but still, is there a huge disconnect? And, and when you look at the fundamentals and, and you put it together with those two metrics, does it make sense? Do they need to correlate somewhat? I mean, it depends really on the token economics, because if you own equity, then it's something else than just participating in the supply and demand dynamics of a token. This is really comparing currencies with security tokens. So for a currency, it's really just supply and demand side that are important. But of course, we need to understand the business models to understand where demand is coming from and how, how big the supply is going to be over the next years. But if we look at security tokens, of course, it's going to be important again. What's, um, what are they exactly doing? What's their revenues? What's their EBIT, etc. But it's just a different token dynamic. Yeah, and uh, having you as an expert here on the show, Desiree, I mean, you look at Cardano, for example, up 220%, as I was saying in my intro this year alone, and Chainlink up about uh, 290% for the last 52 weeks. Tezos also doing very well over the last 52 weeks. You look at them uh, as an expert. Do you see any kind of you know, correlation with what they stand for. And with such a big rally, would you still buy into this kind of protocols, these kind of coins? So uh, this is no investment advice. <laughs> First oh, absolutely. Of all. absolutely not. Don't. <laughs> Any um, of the inventory viewers do yeah. not act upon what you hear. Just <laughs> listen, learn, get out of your comfort zone, <laughs> stay curious. You know, these are the mottos. But still, Desiree, you are in the business and you, you sell the fund and certificate. You as an expert, how do you, judge these kind of movements so uh, actually we quite like chain link we we had it as a holding in the fund for quite a while and then we sold it because we thought that it already made quite a nice um up move and uh it actually reached our fair price level um what we are currently invested or looking at is more um i mean we have a position in bitcoin and ethereum But we also quite like the centralized exchanges like uh, Binance or FTX. I mean, lots of people don't know because they are not very close to the space how fast these exchanges are developing and what's really the volume they are trading. I mean, for example, Binance, their revenue and even their EBIT is bigger than the one of Nasdaq by now, which yeah. is a huge number. We are also looking at um, the decentralized finance space also for investing. I mean, we didn't join in the very first round because there are still a lot of risk factors for us. 
There are a lot of young projects with unproven protocols, and we don't want to be part of a bug in a software. Um, and also, we don't want to send money of the fund to an external wallet. So uh, we missed the first round with direct investments, but uh, we are now slowly starting to build positions in more proven protocols that are three, four years old, yeah. but also interacting with the DeFi space. I would like to drill a little bit deeper into the DeFi space. And I'm so happy, Desiree, that you're actually mentioning it because there's been a lot of attention on that space because of this crypto rally. And uh, more and more money was locked in. And I dug out and found um, a statistic about the decentralized finance industry, which, if you look at the articles, if you search online a little bit, seems to be a real potential threat or potential threat getting more and more real for the traditional finance industry because of its cost efficiency, its velocity, and the automated system on a blockchain, of course. Back in June 2020, about a billion US dollars were locked into the DeFi space. By August, like a couple of months later, it was at nine billion US dollars. And that brings me back to what you said, you know, these stock exchanges such as Binance really are growing, they are mushrooming, and they are really a force to reckon with because, again, also what you said, there are more and more institutional investors that are moving into the crypto space because they just have to put at least a finger into the honeypot. Um, it's a really interesting space. Tell us a little bit, just for our viewers, how you would define DeFi, decentralized finance, opposed to the traditional finance. Just a couple of hinges, so we all get the picture. Sure, yeah, you're right. A lot of money has flown into the space. We are at around $11 billion now. And um, I mean, Binance is still a centralized exchange, but there are now decentralized exchanges popping up, which are really without the company, without a CEO or a CFO or anyone sitting in an office behind it. So this is really difficult to understand for people not used to this new world. Um, there are no companies anymore, no headquarters. And this also makes it really difficult for the regulator to track down these new projects because these new projects like, I mean, Uniswap is one example. Um, they they will start trading uh, security tokens and uh, issue products um, or like certificates or similar products. And for the regulator, this will be really difficult because there is just software in the background. And really the removal of the human being and being totally tech makes it decentralized? Yeah, because it's not one point of failure i mean there is not a headquarter you could knock on the door and uh, uh, speak to the person who built it because it's many software um, engineers or software programmers in the background and it's just software <laughs> so it's all automated which makes it cheap fast um, also reliable when it's on the blockchain but for now it's also dangerous because there can still be bugs in these softwares yeah. So we really try to focus on those that really invented the software and not the copycats out there. Yeah. So I, I, I agree. I think this will be a huge competition to traditional finance. And I actually think it will be faster than we think because of the environment we currently have with negative interest rates, for example. Because what do you prefer? Putting your man, money on a bank account where you pay negative interest rates or earn money on your fiat holdings in the crypto space. Because if it's safe and you can earn money on it, why wouldn't you do it? No, absolutely, absolutely. And, and I see the velocity of the development in that space, technological development, uh, the people are coming in, the money is coming in. And I think there is so much momentum that it will continue. And you see also traditional banks trying to move more and more digital. Uh, they are not catching up. It, it, is, it is very hard for them to catch up. Um, but of course, they still have the lion's share of the investors' money in their vaults. Desiree, Let's move our conversation a little bit to what you mentioned. You mentioned regulation. Very, very important. How regulated or not, or how protected or not, are investors potentially investing into the crypto space? That's a very broad question. Um, I think that you don't have a lot of protection. It's still trial and error. <laughs> I mean, 
you need to be careful. You need to read news and to know what's going on and what's happening and where the risks are because nobody will give your money back in most cases, especially if it's decentralized or if there's a bug in the system. But this is also where the return premium comes from at the moment, because as soon as everything will be clear and regulated and there will be no risk anymore, returns will be much more normalized than they are right now. So in our case for the fund, we are really careful. We choose to trade over exchanges that are proven, that have security funds in case there is a hack, for example. They keep a lot of their exposure on cold storage instead of a connection to the internet. Um, they have two-factor authentication. They really do anti-money laundering checks. So. Otherwise, we couldn't leave our money there because it would be very uh, uns unsafe. But um, these new developments in the DeFi space, in the decentralized finance space, uh, I, I don't think there is much protection for the investor for now. Mm. That's also why we focus on older, more proven projects with a software that works and that most probably doesn't have any bugs. Yeah, which on the other hand makes it a bit more difficult to find these kind of crypto unicorns to be put into the fund and continue that kind of performance you've, uh, you've already managed to gain over the last few months. Uh, Desiree, you mentioned also institutional investors. You're seeing more and more institutional investors investing in your products as well. When you see them, when you pitch with them and offer their, uh, your product, what is the main concern you're still feeling? Where do you have to work most to see and convince these uh, traditional investors? Yeah, it actually has really changed a lot. I mean, for us, the biggest problem at the beginning was really uh, the product itself. Uh, the structure is a BVI fund and a crypto BVI fund and banks actually didn't accept it for trading. So we had investors, but banks wouldn't let them in uh, without explaining why. So that's why we came up with the idea of launching a tracker certificate uh, with a Swiss ISIN number, uh, which is the same thing. It basically invests in the fund, but it has a different structure and is therefore accepted by the banks. So this was for us a very important step because the client wants convenience. And our typical client is above 40, I would say. They don't want to take care about uh, analyzing and uh, storing their crypto tokens correctly. They don't trust in a wallet on their phone. It's a different generation. They want an old product or um, a traditional product like a fund or a tracker, which they can see uh, in their account, in their bank account, next to their gold holdings or equity holdings, that makes them feel comfortable. So I think for us, the biggest uh, issue was the structure at the beginning. And this uh, has now been solved. Yeah. And, you know, you're talking about, well, people being above 40, investing in your product. Disclaimer, I'm invested in your product. I've got uh, my kids part university fund. I bought your certificate. And so, and the reason was not necessary because I feel uncomfortable having a wallet on my phone. It was just the process of having a wallet and then the key and, and everything is just not user-friendly yet in that space to do it yeah. myself. And yes, I went for your certificate simply because of convenience. I also have an exchange, exchange traded um, product uh, in crypto because of convenience. Yes, it costs yeah. me a little bit, but the convenience is great and I'm in a new space. I can observe it. And before I go and buy individual coins, I have a lot to learn and maybe I will never learn it or feel comfortable enough in order to do it myself, hence my transferring of my money to, um, to places like, like your own, that, that certificate. And I think uh, that this is something that is, you know, so important. The process of how easy or difficult it is to get into this new disruptive space is a major, uh, a major point. And I also think, as you just said, it's such a fast developing space. So passive strategies, in my opinion, are not the right approach because the biggest 10 tokens of today will not be the biggest 10 of tomorrow. <laughs> so, I mean, if you look at the biggest 10 tokens of 2015 and the biggest 10 of today, 
only Bitcoin survived within the biggest 10. All the others were exchanged by new business models, which are better compared to the old ones. And this is where we see our main task. We try to identify the future winners when they are still small and trading on rows 30 or 40. And we try to buy them into the portfolio and grow with them. Yeah. And how often do you actually reallocate your assets? Because, because of the velocity, that must be quite frequent too. Uh, we, we are not day traders or very frequent traders. We probably trade once or twice a week because we have more medium to long term um, expectations or analysis that we use. Hedging. Hedging is something that, of course, is important for protection in a space where regulation might be as of lack. Can you really hedge your bets if you are, once you are in the crypto space? Sure. We use futures for hedging mainly. And the futures market is uh, very liquid. Um, there are futures on Bitcoin and many other coins. And we actually mainly use them for hedging. And in, in, terms, in terms of diversification, again, I think that is an important issue. Uh, yes, I can go through instruments like yours, but even you and your, your fund structure or certificate structure, when you're having more than one out there, how easy is it to diversify? Because the quality and the velocity make it potentially harder. So um, the main thing is liquidity, because there are by now around 5,000 tokens being traded on uh, crypto exchanges, but most of them are not liquid at all. So when we apply our liquidity filter, we get around 50 tokens we can invest in, because we want to be able to move in or out of a position yeah. within two days. So uh, we look at these 50 tokens and apply our fundamental valuation models to then determine around eight to 10 tokens we really want to invest in. And there are phases where we have less than eight or 10 tokens. For example, when we launched a fund and also last year, it was just Bitcoin performing. So we had a large position in Bitcoin. While now we think it's really the time of the altcoins uh, it's a select group of altcoins with really a quality behind and a, a business model that we really like and understand. But um, now we are quite well invested in around 10 tokens. Okay, 2020 in my intro, um, I mentioned it. we are mid-October. The year is almost at a close. What is your outlook for 2021? We had the crypto winter now behind us, then we had the crypto spring. Are we moving more and more into the summer? I, I think so, yeah. We are, from our analysis, really seeing the next bull market. I mean, the environment is good. I mean, the, the current environment with um, inflation fears, negative interest rates, what we just discussed, this leads to demand. And then on the technical innovation side, we have the decentralized finance space that develops really quickly. And we think this will be the next innovation cycle. After the ICO boom that we had on the Ethereum platform, we really think now it's time for decentralized finance. There will be a lot of new business models that will be brought to the market that will challenge existing industries like finance or um, uh, also insurances. So we think these are the big drivers and we, we see uh, a very good outlook for altcoins especially. Yeah, no, I'm very excited also about DeFi. Absolutely. I'm, I've been watching that for a while. And uh, yeah, and the fundamentals are kind of starting to follow more and more what is actually happening in that space in terms of valuation as well. Education. Within, within your company, what you're also doing, and I guess this makes potentially your future sales cycle shorter, the more people know, the better, because your information, your fund certificate falls on ears that have already heard something. How big is the educational part that you're engaging in right now? And what's sort of the feedback of your, I think you do crypto breakfasts on a regular basis? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, we do crypto breakfast for interested uh, potential investors of ours where we give an update with regards to what we see in the market, to new technologies like decentralized finance, and also, of course, an update with regards to the fund. Uh, but we also educate on universities and um, for companies. Um, and I have seen this as a very positive thing because 
Um, you start talking to lots of different people with different backgrounds. You see what their um, ideas, but also challenges or fears are. You understand your environment much better. And uh, also you start explaining things easier and better, I guess. And um, I mean, I, I am teaching at the Havitzet in Zurich, for example. And uh, it's great to see students even starting um, writing theses about crypto. I, I had one student that works for um, the pension for a pension fund, and he now researched uh, what the what adding on a part of our crypto fund to their portfolio would have resulted in in terms of return and volatility. And the outcome is actually really interesting. Well, I think this is so interesting. You should mention pension fund, Desiree. Of course, the most uh, risk-off kind of uh, investment environment you can imagine. And I think if crypto moves into that space or is able uh, or allowed in that space, then it has really made it to uh, overall acceptance and recognition. Uh, quite quite amazing. I think um, in terms of the fears, isn't the biggest fear that people just lose their money? I mean, to put it bluntly, is it right? Because you mentioned it earlier. Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, that's the... <laughs> yeah, it's, it's like a, a no-brainer. But um, let me conclude our conversation, super informative conversation, Desiree, with the three key learnings you want to pass on to our viewers. I ask this question to every one of my guests. What are the key, key issues they should look out for if they are considering at all moving into the space of investing into the crypto market? I mean, investing in the crypto market is not something for everyone because there is still a lot of volatility. There is still a lot of uncertainty, but there is also the fear of missing out. So uh, you need to be aware that there is volatility, but there can also be a, a high upside. And I think either you do it yourself. I always learn it very well when I try myself with small amounts of money, but just Try to open a wallet, try to get on such an exchange to buy, sell tokens and to store them safely um, if you have the time. Otherwise, try to find a good uh, portfolio manager who does it for you, who has a track record, um, who maybe whom you even know so that you can call if there is an issue. That's something I like to do when I invest um, so that you can feel comfortable. But for me, the most important thing is don't ignore it, learn about it. Maybe it's not the right thing for you to invest, but it's also dangerous to completely ignore it. And if you want to invest, try it yourself or find the right partner. Yeah, I totally agree with you. I think uh, try it out. It is here to stay. It is here to grow as far as I think and a lot of the crypto experts and DeFi experts I'm talking to as well, almost on a daily basis, they're convinced. And with more and more education, more and more products out there with this kind of stunning performances, uh, there's more and more investors that, yeah, FOMO, you just mentioned it, the fear of missing out is around as well. If And if nothing else, with small amounts and at the end, you say, damn, why did I only put in that amount of money? I should have put in all of my money because I would have. But we Thank cannot you. live on I would have and I should have. But see, I mean, you just said the biggest fear of investors is to lose the money. But their biggest fear is also to miss out on it. Absolutely. Absolutely. So. Thank you so much for your time to join me here on Mentory TV on this very exciting issues. Congratulations to your young company, to the success of the fund and uh, also the certificate. And as you were saying, the um, adoption of your type of product, not only amongst the private investors, but also the institutional ones is what eventually long term makes this market also grow and be more stable. I agree. Thank you very much for having had me here on, on this call. It was a big pleasure to talk to you, Patricia. Thank you. And thank you very much, dear Mentory TV community, for having joined me yet again, me and Desiree this time on, uh, on the show for this exciting conversation. Make sure to join us next time round again. See you then. Bye.